Well, I appreciate the opportunity to again come and, you know, before you and talk. This has been a great symposium, and one of the reasons I like to participate is I learn a lot, right? Even though, even, you know, even though I don't necessarily farm cotton, I do interact with a lot of people, and part of it is how do you train the next generation of students that are coming through Texas Tech to understand how we try to solve problems collectively? How do we try to approach each other and actually manage our systems, our, our farms, our, our production systems in ways that do provide a future uh, to the next generation and, and people are interested in that. I mean, I don't know whether you know this or not, my first interaction with RN, which I didn't realize at the time, was he took my class in microbiology when he, when he was working at, at his undergraduate at Texas Tech. And, and I didn't know him at the time, I knew him in class, but that was about it. Until I went up one day and we were at his farm and he said, hey, I know you, and he said, I took your class back in the 90s, right? The one story about class was interesting. I, I had a student come up to me last year. I teach non-majors micro. And she said to me, Dr. Zach, I'm really struggling with this class. I'm doing okay, you know, but I like to get an A. Now, it's November. Classes start in August, and she's coming to talk to me in, in November. And I said to her, Sarah, I said, you know, Sarah, I says, what do you do? And we talked about how she approaches information, how she spends time thinking about things. And finally she said to me, she said, yeah, my mom and dad said that the class was really difficult and I needed to spend a lot of time in it. I says, your mom and dad? And she says, yeah, my mom and dad took your class 25 years ago, met, got engaged, had me, and now I'm here. <laughs> and I said, I've been in this business too long. I have to have my tablet because there were a couple things I wanted to make sure I said relative to some of the discussions that have been going on over these last couple days. And, and it has to do with this whole notion of how ecological systems function. If you haven't thought about it, I come into this aspect of agriculture not ever having a plant and soil course. I'm a, I'm a trained ecologist. I, I work on ecological systems. In fact, my background is a study of fungi. That's how, as you know, that's how I got involved with, with looking at soils and processes and ecosystem processes. So I come at it at a very different way of understanding how ecological principles are part of, of everything we do. We can't separate out the ecology from us as human beings because we're part of the ecology. And as you know, you know, we now talk about the Anthropocene as the human impact on the natural environment. So, you know, we, we had different epochs in geological time, but now we're in the Anthropocene because humanity is affecting all aspects of how the globe functions in some way, shape, or form. And that is part of the segue for a couple points that I want to make. You know, we, one of the concepts that people have talked about over the last couple of days is this aspect of ecosystem services and processes and the fact that natural ecosystems go through successional stages to, re, to achieve some, with what we would call an equilibrium state that is pretty stable for the region, right? And this is, and this is true of whether we're shortgrass prairie, we're Amazonian rainforest, or eastern deciduous forest. But one of the things I think that's, that I've been thinking about listening to some of the comments made over the last day and a half is we know that no-till is where we have to be. We know we can't leave soil bare. And, that's, and, that's, and that is where we have to get to. The question is the type of composition of plants you put in to your fields actually impacts what those six were in the successional process you are and the benefit that you may or may not achieve based on the based on the type of cover crop that you're going to plant and different cover crops are put the system at different successional stages so we'll talk a little bit about that later in, in my talk to, to point out about that the second thing and I and this is the major thrust for today Everything we do at the local level has either a positive or a negative impact at the regional level, and this is true of the national level impacting us. Ecological systems are all interconnected. And so one of the, cons one of the comments that I want to talk about and is, is, is how a lot of the things that you do on your individual farm will have an impact on your neighbor whether you realize it or not. 
and their inability or their lack of commitment to do certain things will impact you also, irrespective of what you do on your own farm. Because we're all part of this ecological system, this ecological landscape, which is the Southern High Plains. And what I wanna, what I wanna do is to talk to you about three small stories about how local or regional or national events can have consequences to you that you don't even realize are ongoing because what they're doing is they're impacting the ecology at a fundamental level as to how ecosystems function. And we don't ever realize it sometimes until it's too late. And then we're in panic mode because we don't understand what these, what these small scale consequences have started and we don't see them until too late. So that's why this whole notion of why, things, why small things matter to ecological systems. Now, the first story is a story that has no way related to anything we do here. So you just need to be aware of that. But it's had major consequences to North America. And in doing that, it underpins how small things have radically changed the United States ecologically. Now, I put this in from yesterday because I think it's important to realize that when you look at the diagram on your left, where we have the natural system, we have these populations and communities and ecosystems and biomes, again, when you look at the Southern High Plains, we see agriculture and we see playa lakes and we see some natural areas. Here, but here's the question. The ecological organisms don't see it as the Kentner farm or the Zach front yard. What they see is an ecological mosaic made up of patches of habitat. And they're moving through it. What happens to your soil in your farm impacts how climate is impacted regionally. It determines how insect pests develop or move through the landscape, bird migration. I don't know whether you know this or not, earthworms migrate. One of the reasons you're getting earthworms here is because the earthworms have been migrating northward in North America for the last 50,000 years. They just haven't got here yet. And those earthworms are migrating, are starting to migrate now through the northern part of the US and into Canada. The last glaciation, they were, they were pushed off by the last glaciation. It took them 50,000 years. Now the other part is, a lot of our earthworms are not indigenous. And they're, draw, and they're brought over from fishermen dropping them off. When I'm back home in Pittsburgh, we have more earthworms now per square foot in my mom and dad's yard in Pittsburgh we ever had, and that's not a good thing. Because they are invasive red jigglers. And when you dig them up and they, and they, and they pop out of the ground and you touch them, they actually jump around. Because they're trying to get away from being eaten. That's why they call them red jigglers. All those earthworms are eating up all the organic matter that that system has stored. Because, the dense, because they're invasive. You can have invasive good things. And, and so earthworms, birds, insects, fungi, bacteria, they're all moving through this environment. And what you do at the local scale can have big impacts on regional events and as such. That's why the 2011 drought was such a flash drought, because the amount of land that was not covered. And it exacerbated the temperature extreme and cause that to happen. Whether you, you may not know this, the National Weather Service has to change each year the algorithms it uses to predict the weather in Kansas once the wheat harvest is over. Because them harvesting all that land in Kansas actually changes the heat flux dynamics of the, of the state. And what they'll do is they will under 
represent what the temperature is because now with all the vegetation gone, the state stores more heat and heats up at night more. But that's also happening in your fields. That's happening any, any landscape. I mean, look at Lubbock. Lubbock now is a heat island. It's, it has enough concrete, and I've lived here long enough to know that as storms approach Lubbock, what do they do? They split and go around. And so what's happening is parts of, this, of, of, of Lubbock are wetter to the east than they've been before because it doesn't rain on Lubbock anymore. Right? Where do all the hailstorms come? They come straight down the interstate. I have no idea why, but you watch them, they come down. So this, this point about small consequences does matter. And these small changes are incremental over time until, as, as Dr. Haight likes to say, they reach a tipping point. And these ecological systems now have another trajectory. And what you have to think about as you think about how we farm in this region is we impact what this region does ecologically, but that has an impact on a lot of other things that go on that help make us sustainable. So that's sort of the gist of where we're gonna go. And I have three stories to sort of show you how these things do play out ecologically. But being a faculty member, I can't not ask you a question, right? Because I, I have to find out where you're at. What has been, from your perspective, the worst ecological disaster in U.S. history? What has been the, the worst ecological disaster in U.S. history? Deep what Horizon? The Dust Bowl. What's that? The Dust Bowl, Dr. Zach. So the Dust Bowl's one. That would be great. The Dust Bowl, for sure. But what would, I, what, what would you say if I say to you, the Dust Bowl was minuscule compared to one I'm gonna show you? This ecological event changed the entire landscape of North America east of the Mississippi. Completely. And in fact, it's still ongoing. It's still ongoing. Deforestation was what may have been one, but it was incremental. So collectively it wasn't. So deforestation might, you know, deforestation might be one. Um, the Dust Bowl certainly, the plowing of the tall grass prairies across North America and breaking them into farms. That's an ecological, that was an ecological disturbance of a large magnitude. But there was even something bigger than that. Is it what happened in the Piedmont area? Mm, you know, that's close, but this one's even bigger. It, the people in areas involved. So this is the first story. So the three stories I have to sh tell you about are a fungal catastrophe, oh, a little more nitrogen can't hurt, and then what will an additional one or two degrees centigrade increase cause? Give me a break, right? So here's the first. Right. So does anybody, can anybody think what that, what that fungal catastrophe was? And where, where's, where's Kelly? Yeah, oh, that's right, okay. So, you know, you were talking about this whole question about how oftentimes we're not good stewards. And in this particular situation, the population of North America did something unbeknownst to the ramifications of what it was doing, and it did it in a way that it started out where people were just trying to make their backyards nicer. That's how it started. And Barry likes history, so I'll put this slide, I put this slide in for him. 1895, this cargo ship arrives in New York City Harbor, and what it brings with it and Cater, once I say what, what the plant is on your, on your right, you'll know what the story is because you're not living in the East. The plant on the right is Chinese chestnut. It's Chinese chestnut. Now, people started importing these from China and Japan around 1895 to grow in their backyard, 
because the American chestnut was too big. And they wanted chestnuts to eat. And the tree, the Chinese chestnut only gets about 12 to 15 feet tall, where the American chestnut gets up to about 150 feet. But here's the problem. So there's an American chestnut there with somebody standing next to it. But here's what happened. What they did not realize is that every single plant they brought in was infected with a fungus in which the Chinese and Japanese varieties were resistant. But what they did not know was the American chestnut tree was completely susceptible. And so you have this fungus called Cryptonectria, right? And it was first observed in New York City in 1904. So it took about six years or so for the fungus to move off of the horticultural trees and to start infecting the domestic trees. And they first showed up in the Brooks Botanical Garden in their grove of chestnut trees that they had there. And if you can see by the headlines, blood extending all over the county, last two trees of chestnuts in Bronx are dying, eats beneath the bark, the state is losing millions of dollars of the, from the disease. Sprays and other attempts to check spread of parasite unsuccessful. Trees in botanical garden are doomed. So what do they look like? Well, you go to the, you know, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, right, in that song, you don't roast American chestnuts anymore. You roast European chestnuts because there no longer is a, is a crop of American chestnuts. There's a person here in, in, in New York City selling them, but that's what the trees look like. The trees are fast growing, great wood, highly resistant. In fact, as, I've many, as many of you know, we had this farm in Wisconsin, and the center beam for this old farmhouse is a chestnut log, right? Probably worth $10 million, right? But that's what, that's what they use to hold up the Haas, and it's still there. But here's the thing. What American foresters realized is that the chestnut was the most effective lumber tree anywhere in North America. It was fast growing, highly productive in terms of wood. You could use the wood for a lot of different things. And so what they did is once they cut, they would go back in and plant monocultures of chestnut wherever chestnut was found. And that's what doomed the chestnut. That's what doomed it. Because what they did is they set up the same thing that happens in agriculture. They set up a monoculture of a tree across that part of North America. And so you can see on this picture on your left, this is a, this is a, this is a woodcut of people walking under what those chestnut, what mature chestnut trees would look like on a Sunday as they work through the park. And there's a picture of people around a chestnut someplace in Virginia. Huge, massive trees. Now, the other thing that you may not realize is that at the time that this started, in the early 1900, half of the population in the United States made their living in some way, shape, or form from chestnuts. Half of the population of the U.S. in that whole region made a living from them. So this fungus is is a neat fungus to look at. There it is. What it does is, if they have breaks in the, this is not transmitted by an insect, it's not transmitted by a beetle, it's simply windblown. And if the tree has a crack in it, or a woodpecker comes and pokes a hole in it, just by chance alone, this fungus producing spores gets into the cambium, and what it does is it girdles the tree. It kills the phloem, which transmits water and nutrients from the roots to the top. And the tree dies in stages as the living part of the tree is killed. This is the natural distribution of chestnut. That disease killed four billion chestnut trees in North America. Completely changed the ecology of everything west of the Mississippi because those trees no longer exist they simply went extinct in their native range. Now, one of the things you'll see is I'll show you how this thing spread. 
And the, at the time, the federal government was spending up to $400 million to try to stop the spread of this fungus. But because of the fact that the foresters had planted monocultures of the tree across its natural range, the spread could not be stopped. That's the, that was the coronavirus for the time. So here's what you have. In 1904, that's New York City is where it spread. So you can see each decade how far those tree, that fungus spread just by wind. Just by wind. And it went through, and by 1950, there were no longer any chestnut trees anywhere. There's a few, the dots are, the dots are where they think, where they have records that chestnut trees still stand. Because it's not an insect transmitted disease, some trees do, do survive. And the trees that are in Wisconsin and Illinois and Michigan were planted there by people moving out of the area into those air aspects of, of, the, of, of the Great Lakes. And it's outside the range of where the fungus would spread by wind. Now, there's a couple groves of old chestnut in Wisconsin. Nobody's gonna tell you where they're at because they're worth about $20 million each. But there's a picture on, on, the, on, on your um, right where a dead stand, a dead tree. But here's where the, what the forest looked like. There's no living tree in it. Those are the ghost forests in Virginia. Each decade, the entire landscape was decimated. The entire landscape was decimated. And now what people are trying to figure out is how do you get chestnut to grow back? Well, what is there now? Oak, hickory, beech, black walnut. The system has completely changed. Succession has gone on, but the major keystone species that allow these systems to function as they did are all gone. And what we're seeing now is the, eco is the ecology of, of forests in the eastern part of the United States are slowly being degraded because chestnuts are no longer part of that forest system. The oaks came in, and they're 150 years old oaks, and now they're dying out too because they weren't made to be the final stage, but the chestnuts were. And so, so there are some chestnuts that still survive. This is one in Maryland. But there's been a lot of research out of New England to talk about how you can restore chestnuts. And it, when the question is, well, what do you do? Well, it's the same thing you do with cotton. You breed for resistance, right? But, but again, none of the plants in North America are resistant. So where do you get the genes from? You get them from the Chinese and Japanese ones. And so they, had this ma they, started, they started this massive breeding program to try to put the genes into American chestnut, but keep the quality of the American chestnut without changing what it looked like and how it grew. And that's been ongoing since 1910. And they're still not there yet. Now there's, they're a little better. So they do have, they do have uh, trials. In fact, this one in the middle, Darling 54, is the current version. You can actually, if you wanted, write to the American Chestnut Society and get a chestnut tree to plant in your yard in Lubbock if you want to, because what they're trying to figure out is what is the susceptibility of, the, of these various varieties, right? And so they're starting to plant these trees back out in the, na in the natural environment and they are resistant to the, to the fungus. But the point I wanted to make is at the time, nobody ever knew that planting a horticultural plant in your backyard was gonna kill four billion trees. Who would have, who would have thought that? The, the point also is that what we do on the landscape and what we do as we, in thinking about how we manage plants and how we manage our agriculture and natural areas, we don't ever realize what the long-term consequences might be of doing things a certain way. But once you start down that road, there is simply no way to recover from that without putting an extensive amount of money. So that's story number one, the whole, the whole story of, of the chestnut. The, por the point I wanna make in here too is that eventually, if the genetics is right, 
we will start to see chestnuts showing back up in these, in these woodlands. The question is, will the woodlands now, since they've, since they've gone ecologically past what they were, will, they, will the chestnut ever be able to be recovered to the, to the extent that it can provide the, the ecological dynamics and stability to these systems that, that they had back at the turn of the 1900s? We don't know that because it no longer is, is the same habitat. This system was grassland. We're trying to manage it as if it is a grassland to some degree, but in actual fact, the, what the grasslands were are not what conditions are now. Okay, second one. A little more nitrogen can't hurt. So there's my box of miracle growing me in my home yard, right, trying to fertilize mine. The, the, you know, we've talked about over, t we've talked about the last day or so about how we want to manage soil health. And one of the things you probably may or may not realize, and I'm saying this from a human-centered perspective, you know, and, I, and our last speaker talked about there are no bad weeds, it's what you do with them, right? There are fungi and bacteria that are weeds. There are fungi and bacteria that are weeds. You know, one of the things about bacteria are they, need, they are nitrogen gobblers. For every amount of gram of carbon they need, they have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about three to four to one. They need a lot of nitrogen to do their thing. So the more nitrogen you put on a system, the more bacteria you encourage. And that's not necessarily good. But there also are a whole group of fungi that like nitrogen too. Even though they have higher carbon to nitrogen ratios, you fertilize and what do you do? You change the composition of the beneficial fungi and the beneficial bacteria to one that are weedy fungi and weedy bacteria. So you're going to have bacteria and fungi in your system, but they're going to be the weeds in the microbial world. And what do weeds do? They don't do much for what you want. I mean, they'll still decompose, but not at the right level. They'll, they still may mineralize some nitrogen, but not to the extent that you need. Because, they're, because ecologically, those life, their life history traits allow them to grow in areas where there's a lot of nitrogen. So what I want to talk about is how does one deal with this nitrogen story about making sure that you apply the right amount? Now, I'm going to use something that I'm familiar with, and this is Big Bend National Park. How many of you have been to Big Bend? Great place. If you have never been there, take a trip down. It is well worth it. So, you know, the picture on, on, your, on um, your left, we see the Chisos Mountains. Um, Big Bend's a, a, a terrific terrain in terms of hiking and going and, and whatnot. And again, a little bit about, you know, what, what you can see at the park. Big Bend is the most isolated national park in the lower 48. It receives the less visitors of any national park in the U.S. And it is the most polluted national park in the U.S. But yet it's the most isolated. There's no big cities around Big Bend. What's the biggest city? Alpine. Marathon. You know, Fort Davis. Those are what are near it. Those are the population centers. Two and a half hours away, three hours away is Midland. Six hours away is Lubbock. So we, when I first started working at Big Ben, we were part of a group that was trying to understand how do you manage soils in the national parks and how do you understand the effect of climate variability on managing soils as to what they do or cannot do? So we were part of a group that, that, that dealt with Big Bend National Park, Olympic National Park, Eye Royale, Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. All these parks had the same issues, different amounts of different types of vegetation, different amounts of rain. Olympic was the wettest, Big Bend was the driest. But they all function the same way. And so the question was, how do you manage soils? How do resource managers actually try to understand what goes on? So one of the things that we came away with pretty quick is then this, this whole notion that deserts and desert systems are water regulated and nitrogen limited. 
because it's the amount of water, it's the timing of water that determines microbial activity. It determines what those fungi and bacteria in the system are capable of doing. It determines when plants respond. And they do this with very little nitrogen, very little nitrogen. And that's what's called the pulse reserve paradigm, right? You have these pulses of moisture and these pulses of activity, and that controls what these systems are. But the point being is these ecological systems, all deserts, all deserts, are nitrogen limited. Now, if you've ever been down there, you know that Big Ben has an air pollution problem. And so you can see the difference. This is looking east toward um, these are the, these are the uh, Sierra Madre Mountains looking east. So we're looking into Mexico at that point in Big Bend. And you can see the difference on between a, a good day and a cloudy day doing, dealing with air quality issues uh, for 213 and 214. You don't see that in Lubbock. And you certainly don't see that in New York City. Maybe LA gets that way from time to time. Most isolated, no regional population centers around Big Bend. And yet, you have, this, you have this air pollution problem. Now, when you see a system like this, that is just not particulate matter in the air. It's a whole bunch of things. And so this is what the composition of that air is. Sulfates make up a large part of it, but the point I want to make to you is you see a bunch of organics and you see a lot of ammonia. And, and that ammonia in that air, what happens to it? Well, every time it rains, it comes out in the rain. And it also falls out of the atmosphere as dry deposition. So what's happening to Big Bend? It is being fertilized, whether it wants to or not, by the deposition of nitrogen in the air. And the question is, where in the hell does it come from? So this is, this, I think this is New York, right? But here's the problem within your field, in my lawn, in every single ecological system on this planet, excess nitrogen does damage. Excess nitrogen does damage. It alters plant growth, it encourages invasive plants, and it reduces microbial activity. It doesn't enhance microbial activity, it reduces microbial activity. So every time I go along my yard and I fertilize my grass, I actually decrease the microbial diversity and output in that yard for a period of time until everything gets back in balance again. And that may take a couple months. Same thing's true every time you fertilize your fields. Why? Because the plants are not going to be the first organisms to take up that nitrogen. The microbes are. And, you're, and by how we fertilize and the, and the extent to which we fertilize, we change vast swaths of microbial activity across the landscape. So, where does the nitrogen come from? Well, this was a study the state did. It started back in 1999. This is their base year. Things have improved since then. But you'll notice the taller the red bars, the more the contribution to the pollution. So this is ammonia emissions. So where is the ammonia coming from at Big Bend? That's that little, little black spot in that part of Texas. It's coming from New Orleans, Chicago, Lubbock, Amarillo, Denver, Austin, Houston, Kansas City, Missouri, Champaign-Urbana. And the question is, how in the hell does it get down to Big Bend? You know the answer. What's a blue northern? What is a blue northern? We, we call it here, right? It's this front that starts out in Canada and just sweeps down the east side of the Rockies. And you can see it coming and you look north in Lubbock, sky's, sky's, sky's dark blue, purple blue. You know the thing is coming. 
Well, as this front moves on, what's it moving through? That. And where do you think all of the Blue Northerns stall out at? In Big Bend National Park. And so what that front does is gather up all the atmospheric pollution that we've put into it from the Canadian border southward, and it pulls it out of the central part of the country and deposits it in this part of the state, in Big Bend. Now, <clears throat> where does the ammonia come from in those places? power plants and automobile exhausts. It's not us fertilizing fields, it's coming out of us burning fossil fuels. And as part of that, we're putting ammonia up. We put, we're putting nitrogen up in the atmosphere. Right? So that's, so that's, so that's, so that's ammonia. Nitrous oxide, nitrogen oxides, you know, they get dissolved in rainwater and do the same thing. But look how much nitrogen oxide gets, gets, gets generated. Salt Lake City, right, you know, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, even parts of New Mexico or Mexico. So it depends upon the time of year because fronts move back and forth. In the summer, the winds are out of the, are out of the south and west and they're pulling all the stuff from that. In the winter, they're pulling from the middle part of the country. But the reason Big Bend is, is as it is is because it's pulling all the atmospheric pollution we put up. Big Bend doesn't generate any of it. It's all coming from outside the state for the most part. So the question is, remember what I said about desert systems, water regulated and nitrogen limited. So one of the things the park wanted us to find out is how much nitrogen is coming into Big Bend and is it having an effect on how its soils function? Because all the plants in Big Bend evolved to, to be have to live to grow in nitrogen limited situations all the microbes have evolved to interact with that and so what we did is we instrumented up the park these number of stations show you and it was very low tech we simply put big funnels and you can get what are called ion exchange resin beads. So every time it rains, the funnels would collect the water, the beads would collect the ammonia and nitrogen that fell through it. We would leave them out for certain periods of time and we would know how much nitrogen was being deposited on that landscape per unit time. And we did that for a couple years. Now here's what you don't know. The federal government does this across the country and it's called the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. And where do you see what it looks like? And my immediate response is, it's not good. These circles represent national parks in the national park system where they're assessing what's called critical load. And that is how much nitrogen becomes deleterious. So it's kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So what you can see for Lubbock, which is in our orange, that you start to change the ecological functioning of every system in this region if you add more than five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. That's what's called the critical load. And we do this for national parks. We do this for all the natural systems. And you can see that some parts of the country have very low critical loads. You can't add much nitrogen without changing the system. For, for Big Bend, the critical load is about between 2.5 and 3 is where the critical load is. If you get more nitrogen coming in, it's deleterious. It's not good. Now, the point being is this. How much do you fertilize your cotton? How, many, how much nitrogen do you put on per year, per hectare? How much do you do for your cotton? How much do you do for your pastures? You are adding onto this because that's how much is being deposited yearly in this region. So when a, when a, when a consultant says, hey, you gotta add this amount of nitrogen, you're already adding 
nitrogen through the atmospheric deposition. So here's what it looks like. I, 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 this data was the, the final year which they tabulated was 218 from the EPA. And you can see, it's the, and now this is wet amount of nitrogen coming in as rain. But there's also dry deposition, which is much more difficult to figure out. But it has to, and that's, and that's what blows around in the dust. One of the things that dust does in Lubbock is it redistributes all the nitrogen. And it falls into your, it falls into your landscape. And so what we can see is that the Midwest has enormous amounts of nitrogen superimposed on top of what any farmer and producer is already doing. But look where Lubbock is. Lubbock's running about an annual amount of, 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 of ammonia somewhere about between 2 and 2.5 kilograms per hectare per year of just atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. And you can see at Big Bend, you know, it's running, it's somewhere, it's getting about 1 to 1.5. So the question is, well, is it having an impact? This is what nitrate is. And again, ammonia is the biggest culprit. Nitrate, nitrogen is not as much, but you still, there's, so the, the other part that you should take away from this graph is there is no part of the continental U.S. that's not impacted. None. Absolutely none. Coastal regions of Texas, Midwest, we're all being impacted by nitrogen deposition that we generate, that we generate. So this is another um, critical load diagram that, that was just recently generated. And these yellow dots and whatnot are, are, are locations that they're intensely monitoring. And you can see, you know, the upper Midwest <laughs> the central part of the U.S. is really impacted because of the industrial areas from the cities. And again, you know, we can see where we are here in Lubbock. We can see, you know, our deposition is running about, you know, in this one it's five to nine kilograms per hectare per year. Critical loads in this one are a little higher, but we're still being impacted. Still being impacted significantly. So what's the outcome? Well, one of the projects we ran at Big Bend is when you first enter the park, this picture on your left, this is what's called tiger-striped vegetation. This is a lowland tobosa grassland in which you see these alternating stripes of bare soil vegetation, bare soil vegetation, and it's part of it's caused by the movement of water across the landscape and how much gets into the ground and how much rainfall there is per unit time. So there's not enough water to support a complete cover on these soils. There's just not enough water. And so we were looking at trying to understand the microbial dynamics and the nitrogen dynamics of these systems over time. And <clears throat> so what we would do is we would run transects perpendicular to the bands and we collect soils and look at how much nitrate and how much ammonia and how much microbial biomass which is the weight of the microbes in that soil and what we would do is what we would do up here we would dig in the we would take samples down to about the 15 centimeter range where most of the microbes are and what you see in terms of the amount of nitrate in this system there's no difference same amount of nitrate is in the vegetated areas as the non-vegetated. So we said, well, what's going on? Well, we started digging deeper. And what you find is that this is, as you go deeper, because there's no vegetation, the system is accumulating nitrate at levels that you don't even put on your field. You would never see these amounts of nitrate in an agricultural field, but yet you see them in a natural system. And the question is why? Because it's chronic low level amounts of nitrogen that get deposited. And what's interesting is you look at, look at what goes on in the bare or in the vegetated. There's no difference, why? Because the plants and the microbes there are actively using what's coming in. So the point being is too is this nitrogen dep deposition and its consequence is what we refer to as a negative feedback loop. 
Once you start accumulating nitrogen, the plants can't take up, can't deal with that nitrogen. So, even, so once they hit that high amount of nitrate, what do they do? Those roots die. And so you never get vegetation reestablished back on that system. Now, what does it have to do with agriculture? <clears throat> How many of you, so we've heard over the last day about plants being able to go down and tap the deeper nutrients. Do any of you know how much nitrate or nitrogen sits in your fields at 120 centimeters? We don't ever measure that. We measure the top, right? But it would be interesting to find out, collectively, we all, you all apply nitrogen, nitrogen isn't being deposited, but where does that nitrogen go? And I suspect a lot of it gets, gets put below ground and gets put in deeper, because the question is, if you don't have an active cover crop on it continuously, you're not gonna pull that stuff up and use it and keep it from being moved on and stored. We have areas in Big Bend where it was grassland, but because of some disturbance, the grasses have come off it. We have 400 parts per million nitrate in these soils, and they're not fertilized. It's just that, it's just that the park's been accumulating nitrate nitrogen for 60 years. But the same thing happens in Lubbock. The same thing happens in Floydata, in Dumas, in Amarillo. We're all still accumulating nitrogen. So what we did is went out and, and tried to see where this, how, does, how is Big Ben reacting to this nitrogen? Well, the one graph I wanna show you is this, the, these points are the various types of, of locations around the park. And what you can see is that the system has already reached saturation. The benefit of adding any nitrogen to the system has already been reached and crossed so that any more nitrogen you're adding is gonna be deleterious. And the system can't actually deal with that amount of nitrogen anymore. So though our microbial biomass has decreased compared to what it was if you stop the amount of nitrogen coming in. Now, what are the plants doing in all this? What are the plants doing in all this? Well, just serendipitously, back in the 40s, when the park was first being established, a botanist out of uh, Saul Ross State set up a series of transects to quantify plant communities in different regions in the park. And they, he, we, so we have good records of what the plants were doing and what types of plants, you know, whether they were cacti and agaves and succulents and grasses and forbs and creosote bush and mesquite and lechuguilla and ocotillo and all those, all those plants that are characteristic of the Chihuahuan Desert. Eight years ago, a group went back and surveyed those plants. 80% of the biodiversity was lost. And what left? All the cacti, all the succulents, all the ocotillos. What do they, what do they get now? Annual grass and creosote bush. And when you look at the physiology of those plants, they all like higher amounts of nitrogen. And so, whether the, so the park obviously can't do anything about the nitrogen load unless the federal government and the EPA has stepped in and is starting to do that in terms of controlling not only what comes out of the US but also has to talk about what comes out of Mexico. But the park's in danger of losing all of its biodiversity, its plant biodiversity because of us burning fossil fuels. but that's impacting the whole rest of the country too. So the question for us is what, how much chronic nitrogen deposition has changed what we have in this system? So the park about a year or so ago did another assessment of, of this critical load in nitrogen deposition and it projected it forward to, to uh, 2050 and again, so at the time it did this in 2006, Big Ben was marginal. Did it exceed the critical load? And it depends on, because we're the only ones that collected any data on this, right? 
but you can still see where the critical loads have been have been exceeded and you do see some parts in in this part of the in this part of the state where we're exceeding the critical load coming in but notice what happens by 2050 most of the country except for the air west has exceeded critical load which means everything we do has been negatively impacted by the nitrogen coming out of the atmosphere and until we do something to stop that we have this major ecological catastrophe that's that's ongoing and is occurring right now because of atmospheric deposition and we don't ever take it into account I mean you know you know and I know that why you know I go out to my yard my law yard always looks greener after a rain right and the question is well why part of it's steady nitrogen and those plants are using that soluble form pretty quickly but the same things happening in your fields every time it rains it's depositing nitrogen and then you're depositing nitrogen so what has happened to the Big Bend invasive species are taking over the park and mostly annual grasses which changes fire regime grasslands degrade and we lose soil health and microbial dynamics and that downward spiral is what's accounting for grassland degradation and invasive species increases and until the park in its national network deals with the amount of nitrogen coming in it can't do anything about it that's just the nature of atmospheric deposition so one of the things to think about is we have to figure out for this region how much nitrogen do you really get in your system and its consequence to this landscape so that's story number two you know we've, we've talked about John Wesley Powell, Powell and this hundredth meridian this is the beginning of what I, uh, my, my last part talking about what will one or two degree increase cause we know that climate is shifting right we know that and it's been it's been shifting for the last 80 years really and the question is well what are the consequences to us because obviously you folks have to manage farms and no-till and stubble management in an environment that is different today than it was in 1970 and so this concept of the hundredth meridian in which Powell said that that line represents the change in the arid west from the more mesic areas to the to the Mississippi that's what sort of set set the tone on that but you'll notice that there is a dash line to the right of that and that dash line is the projected hundredth meridian given current climate conditions so these next series of graphics are going to show you how much the hundredth meridian will move eastward over the next decades now if you look at our average this is for the state of Texas right this is the average December January from 1895 through 2020 um, there are a couple things to take home when you look at this is that you know we've had some periods of very cool average weather in December January but you notice since about 1980 we start to see less and less cool and more and more warm right and this is just this is just average for the state it's not southern high plains they just take the state the NOAA takes the state average and, and figures out what the state is doing but this is the impact to the hundredth meridian as that average changes so 2021 to 2040 you'll notice that what's happening is these darker areas here are migrating into the southern high plains and that line with the white area is moving eastward so we get 2041 to 2060 we see now with the southern high plains and we can see this progressive development of aridity all along the hundredth meridian that's what's going to happen we can't change that because we've already set in motion a whole series of ecological and environmental processes that unless we deal with something later we're not going to be able to we're not going to be able to change it now the state climate uh, the state climatologist Don Nielsen Gammon developed this graphic to show you <clears throat> where are we with Texas in terms of average temperature and so 
He also said, okay, we know the carbon dioxide is one of the, one of the reasons why our temperatures are going up. We simply have that amount of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas trapping heat. What happens if we, do, if we don't do anything or if we have lower emissions, where does that line look like by, by 2100? And you can see that the lower emission, we, we simply stay within a, a little bit more than the current range of change in our temperatures. But what we don't want to do is to exceed these high rates because those are the temperature changes that are going to be more than one or two degrees. So what do we know about what's going on? This is actual data. These are not projections. So, so you can look at how many number of, of warm days have we seen in Texas. And what you can see is that you know, we've, you know, we had this very cool period in the 60s and 70s. And if you think about it, Texas built a lot of infrastructure during that time. Right? But those cool periods were abnormal. But now we see, our, we see that we're getting warmer nights much more above what Texas ever saw prior to 1895. That's, the, that's as far back as the data will go. So we can't say more than that. But this is, what's, but this is how those warm nights are going to change precipitation. And so what we see is roughly for us about a 5% about a decrease in precipitation projected across, across the state. And you'll notice that, that parts of the Northwest, parts of the Northeast, my farm in Wisconsin is going to be rainy. We're never going to grow CBD up there if this happens, right? It's just going to be too wet. I'm trying to think what I can grow with, 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 with wet. I'll probably grow, start growing rice or something like that. So this is out of the, um, the South Central Climate Adaptation Center. These are projections for historical days and what's going to happen over time. And this is just projections and number of hot days, right, in terms of what, uh, under the various different types of emission scenarios. And what you can see is, depending upon um, what happens, this, these bottom two panels indicate the change in number of hot days, right? And these are days above 90 is what they're looking at. And what we can see is we're going to start getting, we're going to have more warm days that are above 90 over the year. What about the wettest days? So they take the seven wettest days and look at change. And what you can see for us is we get drier. We don't necessarily get wetter. And what about consecutive dry days? And when you start to look at this, what you begin to see is whether it's a lower emission or a higher emission, we're going to have what's called a longer interpulse period in which the interval between rain events is going to be longer and longer and longer. So we may still get the same amount of rain as we've been talking about. We may still get 18, 20 inches. It's all going to come in two days. And the question is, how do we, how do we plan for that? How do we develop ecological systems that can respond to that and build soil health with the capacity to, to store that rainfall? And this gives you an idea, this is actual data, what has been the rate of temperature change across the US. And so, you know, here we are here. And so the rate of change is roughly between one to two degrees centigrade per decade. But what's been the economic impact? So what, what this study did is it went and looked at the temperature changes, the precipitation changes, and calculated the economic damage as a percent of gross domestic product for that county. And, you know, somewhere in here. So, you know, we're looking at anywhere of about a five, maybe a 10% economic damage impact on Lubbock County and the surrounding area as a consequence of climate change. And again, this isn't projected. This is what, when you, take all the, when you take all the calculations of what's gone on, what's happened to your farms, what's happened to the, to the region, this is, what it, this, is, this, is what they, this is what they're projecting. And you see parts of the country actually do much better as a consequence of, as, as a consequence of the thing. So there's going to be winners and losers to a lot of degree. What about changes in some of the things that impact you? Frost-free days, frost days. 
number of consecutive hot nights. And what you can see is they're all going to be changing in some way, shape, or form. So, our, so as our weather starts to change and our climate heats up and our, the number of warm nights, those one to two degrees do start to have an ecological impact in terms of frost nights, in terms of, in terms of getting rid of pathogens and getting rid of disease organisms. And this one looks at agricultural yields across. So it takes that economic data, it takes the climate data, and it says, okay, what has happened to, to, to agricultural productivity? Um, and interestingly enough, Lubbock comes out right now very well. We don't see a decrease yet. Right? You see that in other parts of the state. I would not want to be farming down in here right? in, term, in, in terms of agricultural productivity. Now, we in the Climate Center of Tech just recently started to run these models based on new information. And basically what this, what this graph shows you is the number of days above 100 degrees. And this is actual data. So this is looking at 1950 to 1959. And roughly, we can see here in Lubbock, we're running somewhere about, up to about 20 days per year where it's 100 degrees or more. Right, you know, and you can see different parts of the surrounding area are warmer, um, but that's what it looked like in 1950. 1970 to 1979, what you begin to see is this change along Mexico and then down along the Rio Grande, but basically Lubbock and the surrounding Southern High Plains stays the same. So in the 70s, it's not, it hasn't changed much. We get to 2000, and what do you see? the whole state is starting to experience more 100 degree days. And it's, it's not much, you know, in terms of numbers, but it's still showing that. What about 210 to 219? And again, this is actual data. This isn't projected. This is what we've seen. Mexico's in bad shape. So is the lower Rio Grande. But the whole state of Texas is getting warmer and warmer. And what we're seeing now are these incidences of, of, of higher temperatures showing up around the region. Wichita Falls, the Dallas area. Right. This is, this is 2020 to 2029 in terms, of, in terms of projected. Look at Big Bend. 80 days or more of 100 degrees. 80 days or more is what the projections are based on the current climate models. 2040 to 2049. So, to finish this off, we know that we can exacerbate that outcome. Nothing we do locally will change that outcome. But we can exacerbate it by how we deal with the landscape in terms of vegetation and how we manage soils and their capacity to store moisture and have moisture alleviate some of the temperature changes. So as I've indicated to you earlier, when the state of Kansas harvests its wheat, the National Weather Service has to change its algorithms because of how that landscape stores heat and releases it because they, they underestimate the temperature. So anything we can do to eliminate bare soil is important. But bare soil also impacts albedo and changes cloud formation. Dust increases downwind rainfall, right? The larger the landscape footprint, the more the impact. And that's both positive and, and negative. So what I would say is well, collectively, we, you, have to address this whole notion of how we manage not just your farm, but how you as individuals interacting manage the entire landscape of the Southern High Plains. That's a tall order, but something has to organize that. Because if we all were to just to be serendipitous, we're going to see the negative feedbacks because of how ecological systems are integrated across that landscape. So what are some agricultural amplifiers? We already know this degraded soils, monoculture cropping systems. They simply exacerbate these kinds of ecological facts in simplified landscapes. Where even though we're doing rotations, that's not enough. 
We have to figure out better ways of integrating a diversity of things as, this, as these systems respond to climate and as landscapes modify climate. And final thoughts, we're going to have to figure out what, what, is the, what is the impact of nitrogen deposition to this region because it's only going to get worse as the population of the U.S. and Texas increases. You're going to have more atmospheric deposition. And so while you're figuring out what your nitrogen needs are for your farm, Mother Nature is raining nitrogen on it. And we don't take that into account. Right? And then, as we know with the chestnut, elimination of keystone species is going to change everything. So for us in the Southern High Plains, we don't know any longer what are the keystone species that, that have these systems functioning the way they should be. Because we haven't paid that, we haven't paid attention to that kind, kind of stuff. But all ecological systems function with a variety of biodiversity that alters what it does. And then obviously, often changes go unnoticed until it's too late. And then we don't, and then, then all we're doing is responding. <laughs>